Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Buckeye Weekly Podcast. I am Tony Gerdeman, here as always with Tom Orr. Tom, how's it going? Well, it's raining. It's been raining all week. It's continuing to rain. I think tomorrow it's supposed to rain. So I'm great. How are you? You mentioned the rain. Um, today in, in my yard were two ducks. Uh, one was standing in the water. Another was, looked like just like they were on a pond. You know, couldn't see their legs, just enjoying the water. Um, couldn't do anything about it. I've succumbed to the water. Did you see the picture of uh, Sayada River? Yes. Very downtown. It's uh, looking brisk and tall. And no end in sight. Although I hear it's going to be like 82 and sunny on the weekend. So everybody will get down to go, you know, go to Columbus Commons, the Scioto Mile, all of that. And it's going to, you know, hopefully it won't be underwater. People can enjoy themselves at a distance with their masks and their gloves. I do love wearing gloves in 80 degree weather. It's I'm one of the few. I've I've done it for years. (laughs) I enjoy uh the hot sweaty um feel of plastic against my hands the the suffocation of the skin it's a, you know it just makes me feel alive tom have you ever tried it <laughs> this this sounds like some weird david carradine stuff i'm not sure i'm not sure i'm down um this this show got real weird real quick we we're just talking about <laughs> Suffocating your skin in the heat with mm-hmm. plastic or rubber or whatever kind of uh, asphyxiable materials you have, Tom. It's not weird. This is definitely going to have to go <laughs> behind a paywall at this point, I think. <laughs> no, so we want to thank you all for listening. Um, when, when I talk about stuff like this, I immediately start thinking about Gordon Gee. Um, So. <laughs> is, is there a bow tie on your gloves? We all, I think everybody loves Gordon Gee, right? Yes. I, you, if you don't take him so seriously, don't take yourself so seriously. I mean, he's, he's, he's a good dude who sure spent a lot of money. Probably shouldn't have at Ohio state and likes to live a certain way. Uh, and who doesn't. So, um, but the reason we bring him up is he's had some comments over the last couple of days, last week or so, which have been very um, encouraging in terms of playing college football this year. Uh, I think on May 13th, I think his quote was, we are going to play football in the fall, even if I have to suit up. Wow, that would be great uh, to see him out there. And you know what? I wouldn't be surprised if at some point he is dressed up because that's that's the kind of guy he is, just suited up, uh, maybe for the the season um, opener. But then uh, on Monday, he was on Feinbaum, and this is he finally brought up a subject that we have talked about and wondered what happens when a player comes down with the coronavirus. And his quote was, if one of our athletes gets coronavirus, we can't just shut the whole thing down. We have to learn how to control that part of it. And for me, just finally having somebody acknowledge that you, things wouldn't necessarily have to be shut down. I think is positive because that was that's one of the the fears is what happens when you get started somebody gets it what is the protocol for dealing with that now and to have him say like well you, you know we'll we'll have protocols for it we'll have a, a system set up that doesn't include everybody out everything is shut down we're wiping down everything we're shutting it you know we're not playing this week uh, so I think. That is a huge positive. He's one of the first guys to come out and, and talk about that aspect. Other, you know, commissioners uh, are starting to come out and talking about playing this year. But this has always been one of the big fears. And for me, Tom, it was good just to have somebody address it, saying that that wouldn't end things right there. Right. I mean, that's that's certainly a positive if there's at least some momentum towards the idea that that would not end everything right there. You still have to get everyone to agree on that. And that's, you know, we're, we're not there yet, but, and, and you've had enough different opinions expressed that you wonder whether you will be able to get everyone on the same page at some point, um, or if there's going to have to be some like middle ground found. 
And there, and to me, there's a you know there's a difference between one kid tested positive and fifteen kids tested positive. Like there's there's a there's a difference there in terms of the severity of your response. Um, and and I don't you know you have you have to get university presidents on board and conference commissioners probably on board and football coaches on board. It, it seems to me like getting the players on board is probably not going to be the hard part. It's going to be getting all the people who are in kind of greater positions of authority over institutions who are probably just by their nature a little more risk averse, getting them all on the same page is going to be the challenge. And, you know, if if a university president like Gordon Gee is already kind of on that, you know, of that of that mind to, you know, maybe maybe be a little more willing to sort of figure it out and trust trust that the medical community will be far enough along with testing and treatment and all of that kind of stuff that that they can take that take that avenue and and take that that path to um be willing to sort of i mean i don't know if roll the dice is the right word but be a little more willing to to give something a try then then that certainly would bode better than uh better than you would probably guess two weeks ago in terms of the likelihood of there being a season mm-hmm. the the what ifs i'm sure they're going to be going through all of those you know what if two people what if five people what you know what happens when you've got 15 and like you said, like then it's time to shut a team down for a week, two weeks. Are those forfeits? I think it would probably have to be. Um, you know, you, you, the key would be just <laughs> avoiding those situations. Now, basketball, college basketball has flu season every year and coaches have to deal with it every year. I remember a few years ago, like two or three years ago, maybe Chris Holtman's first year. Um, either Jay Sean Tate or uh, Kate Bates Diop, somebody somebody big was down with the flu, and I asked him, you know, do you prefer having the flu? Do you prefer going through your team early in the season or or late in, in the season? Nobody wants it, you know, late. And he's like, I didn't really have a preference, but it's something that you always have to deal with. And when somebody gets sick, you isolate them. You try not to let them get everybody else sick. So this has gone on in college sports for a long time where you don't want an outbreak of anything on your team and flu is a real thing every year for basketball and football and so you try to keep the the sick people from getting the healthy people sick and generally it works you know so there are some uh this is not a new thing this is a um an existing problem in terms of just the overall health and keeping guys from getting sick. So I think leaning on that a little bit, uh, which, which this will be ramped up even more so, but it's not a completely new thing. And we're even seeing some of the, the new rules in place now as coaches are now coming back to campus. Uh, you wrote about it uh, this week where you talked to Ohio State about it go over the rules involved in allowing coaches back into the Woody. Sure. So basically this is all part of the broader uh, work with the university's transition task force, which is the group that is sort of figuring out the, okay, now what portion of this for Ohio state? Like when are the, uh, when are students going to be able to log back on campus? When are they going to start doing activities on campus? All of that kind of stuff. And, uh, they said that a limited number of Ohio State football staff members will be transitioning back to work in the Woody Hayes Athletic Center this week. All staff entering the facility will take a daily symptom assessment, including having their temperature taken. Staff will follow physical distance guidelines, wear face coverings when together, and will be strictly limited in terms of available offices and maximum number of individuals in a room. The weight room, training room, dining room, uh, indoor facility, and locker room will all remain closed during this return to work transition. 25 total, 13 offense, 12 defense. Uh, staggered times for offense and defense, only three days per week and three hours per day. No one else, uh, no, more, no more than 10 in any of the staff meeting rooms that are available, and there won't be that many from each group there at one time now. So, you know, I mean, it sounds like basically you've got, they're breaking the coaching staff and, uh, you know, grad assistants and quality control guys down into uh, several different smaller groups. So, you you know, you're potentially... You know, you, you have, uh, I don't know, they, they didn't say exactly how many different uh, uh, different groups there were, but let's say there's four different groups 
uh, there among the 25 total coaches, you only have, it sounds like, six people in the building at a time or something like that. And they are uh, splitting it up. So, you know, if the, the same six people are around each other. So if, you know, those six people uh, don't, you know, cross paths with someone, you know, the six offensive coaches don't cross paths with six defensive coaches and potentially get more people sick if someone does get sick. And, you know, I'm sure that they're being extremely cautious about not going outside of these small groups, just, you know, not not all, uh, you know, rushing down to uh, a bar in the short north or something like that to to hang out and uh, potentially expose themselves to something. So, I, I mean, they're being extremely cautious. And, you know, my, my overall takeaway from this was two completely opposite thoughts. One was how completely insane this all would have sounded like two and a half months ago. You know, if you had told me on March 1st that, okay, by mid-May, this is how they're going to be, you know, this is going to be the situation to get into the Woody Hayes Athletic Center. Uh, you would have you know, would have thought it was insane and like completely unthinkable. And now it's like, oh, this is real progress. Like they're they're letting people back in the building now. This is a pretty good first step and potentially a model for, you know, something that they can potentially scale up uh, when players are finally welcome back into the program that, you know, potentially you have just the offensive linemen are in there working out and, you know, they all work out together and then they sterilize the, uh, the workout room or the weight room. And then, uh, and then the defensive linemen come in and then the running backs come in and then the linebackers come in and you just sterilize everything between things and you keep spacing things out and keep people sort of in these little sub groups or these little bubbles almost where you're not potentially cross contaminating people and, and all of that. Like, this this would have all sounded insane two months ago, but now it's like, oh, this is actually potentially really a a, a road forward and and potentially a really hopeful sign that that maybe they they will be able to do something this fall. Yeah, it's certainly a big step, but it's also like a, a baby step. And then you think you you think about how just detailed and incremental and how well planned every day is at within the Ohio State football program. And then you add this onto it and it has to become even more detailed and, and more incremental. And it's, I think it's good to already have such a complicated program to run. You know, like this, things are already so regimented and every little second is planned out. So now, now you've got this where it just takes even more planning, but that's okay because it's almost run at a, at a military type of accuracy. And so you're, this is, it makes for long days for, for some people. Not that they're going to have one weight, you know, a couple members of the weight staff be there from say eight to eight because that's, I mean, these things are going to be staggered all throughout the day and everything is going to be staggered and some guys can come in and some guys can't. And it would be interesting to see the spreadsheets that come from, you know, like, well, I like you look at Josh Myers. So I'm allowed to be in the WAC from seven to nine. Then I have to leave. Uh, then I can come back in for 45 minutes here. And then, then I'm out because the defensive line. And you mentioned coaches, you know, going out for lunch or whatever. The amount of discipline that is going to be required as well. Uh, you're, you're talking about like the 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 NBA or, or um, NHL, wh whichever it is, talking about how a bit Major League Baseball. I think players aren't allowed to go out to eat, or you know they can't Uber anywhere. Just the discipline involved is going to be uh, immense as well. Uh, you're going to be asking a lot of people to to change their lives quite drastically, but also that's what college athletes do, you know. So. That their life is much different once they get to college. And so like Ohio State is conditioned to be able to become more regimented, so are college athletes, I think. Um, you, you just have to – they just have to be careful once they are allowed to, to go out and about. You mentioned the short north. Everybody saw pictures uh, of what that looked like on, on the first couple of days. Um it would be – imagine, Tom, being the guy or being a guy 
who ends up getting sick from going out. These guys are so scared of letting their teammates down. So now you, you, you factor in like you're a college kid. You like to go have fun, but the fear of letting your team down when they need you, I think um, for most guys that would probably win out over the desire to go out or, or go against some sort of protocol that has been put in place for you. Um, you're going to have guys that are very, very work, working very hard to not get sick because they want to be available for their teammates. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that was something that, um, you know, Wyatt Davis and Josh Myers talked about when we talked to them uh, a few days ago. Basically, like, let me know what I need to sign to play because all, all I want to do is play. Like, that's what I want to do. I want to play. And y- you would think that probably a lot of those guys, those guys have, you know, potentially some you know, showcase season for the NFL, you know, reasons that they want to play this year in addition to the normal stuff. But you would think that guys who are football players at this level, it takes a certain amount of dedication, a certain amount of, of uh, you know, history and a certain amount of time that you've sunk into this to be to get to this level. So you're obviously pretty probably taking your football pretty seriously if you're play, a football player at Ohio State. And so that is probably an easier sell for Ohio, you know, for Ohio state players than it is at lower levels. Um, and the other thing that I think might work in their favor is the Woody Hayes athletic center is set up to be a place that basically it's a one-stop shop for Ohio state football players. Like, especially during fall camp before seasons, the season starts, we were in there last, what, August, late July, early August. And they had, they gave us a tour of the the whole facility and we got to see the cafeteria area and the meeting rooms and you know all the all the different stuff and they had a schedule on the board uh you know on like monitors there that was like here's the here's the schedule for the the day and you know the the freshmen showed up at what 6 30 in the morning seven in the morning something like that and then there was stuff all the way through the day until eight o'clock at night or something like that and guys weren't necessarily there for the full time or active actively there for the full time. But, you know, there's there is a dining room there. There's a, you know, a kitchen there. There's like a full dining facility. They have nutritionists there. They have recreational stuff there. They have a barbershop there. They have workout facilities there. They have uh, an academic center there. Like you could, if you wanted to, do everything but sleep there. And, you know, they even they even have air mattresses for guys who want to kind of crash between uh, practices or whatever during the fall. Like, they have... It is just about a one-stop shop. So if you wanted to really just completely put these guys, like, in a biodome almost and just say, okay, no one, no one gets to do anything other than, uh, you know, come to the facility and you're going to take all your classes online and... Uh, you're not going to step foot on campus. You're not going to talk to anyone outside of the football program. Like you might get buy-in from guys who really want to play badly enough that you might be able to make that work. But I don't. I there, there are a lot of places that are probably not set up to do that kind of thing. So while that might work at Ohio State, that may not work at other places. Yeah, and we're we're talking so much about how everybody has to agree on um, on so much of this the players would also kind of have to agree with that. And the reason they've done all of this stuff to the whack is to keep people to encourage players to stay there, to be there as much as possible. And you know, there's a barbershop there. There's arcade games. There's a pool table. There's air hockey. There's the, the food court, food court place where you can get all your, your, your necessities. There's chefs, there's cold foods, there's hot foods, there's breakfast, breakfast for dinner, you know, just, Perfect. Who could who could possibly decline that? Um, and, and we'll talk more about Josh Myers and Wyatt Davis probably in a, in a later show. But Myers also said he would feel safer at Ohio State, and it wasn't about his safety. It was about him getting his family sick, and, and that's something that would concern him. And as much as he, it would be a sacrifice to be away from his family, he would know that as long as he is somewhere else. He's not putting them in danger, which is another completely like to tell you exactly how mature Josh Myers is and why Davis. I mean, Tom, listen to those two guys and I said, you know, we'll talk about it later, but these are two of the best representatives of, of a college football program you could ever hope to have. Um, 
but they are like they're willing to do what it takes to get this season played. And now, yes, they have their plan. This is their contract year, so they may have more incentive than others. Um, and you know, will a redshirt freshman feel the same way? Will a true freshman feel the same way? I, you know, maybe, maybe not. Um, but being at the WAC where you can be monitored and you can, you've got everything you need. Uh, they have so many free clothes in their locker rooms. They probably don't even need to do laundry. Um, and everything they would need, as you said, is there. Uh, even even a theater area, but it's the the uh, the buy in the la- the the amount of commitment from everybody. Um, does it have to be one hundred percent? Does a team have to be one hundred percent in to play? Like, what happens if a guy doesn't want to play? I would expect some sort of eligibility issues this year, where like, um, if you miss a couple of games. Because people are going to get sick, you know it's going to happen. Somebody's going to have a coronavirus. You miss three games. Do you? Do you like? What is the six games for uh, for a red shirt? Would there be? Do you allow players to sit out this year, even if they've already red shirted? I think there are going to be some additional rules. Uh, probably then, Tom, you would also have to have additional scholarships if you're going to extend. Uh, eligibility, you're going to have to increase the 85 scholarship limit or else you're going to put coaches and players in, in rough situations. Just anything you want to talk about, feel free. Cause I know I, I, I jumped around there. <laughs> um, yeah. I, the, the question of like how, it, you know, if guys decide they're not going to play, like how do they handle that? That's, that's a really interesting one because of course you you can't make guys play. I don't I don't think that that you're probably going to have a ton of people who decide not to play. I mean, I, I talked earlier about how college presidents and uh, athletic departments are run run by people who are probably a little more risk averse than the average person. Uh, 18 to 21 or 22 year old males are not generally known for tremendously high levels of risk aversion. I think you're probably going to have uh, a. a the, a lot of guys are going to test positive for YOLO uh, in terms of that. Like just, you know, yeah, we'll just go, what's the worst thing that could happen? Like, that's just, there, there's a certain amount of uh, invincibility sort of hard coded into the brains of uh, college age males, rightly or wrongly. Um, so that, that I don't, I don't think you're going to lose a ton of guys to that. Um, I do wonder about coaching staffs. Like, you know, you've got, you have people who are in, you know, probably in demographics that are they're a little more at risk than uh, college players are who are on coaching staffs, and you know that's that's got to be a little bit of a concern, and you know, but but you you will probably have you will probably have guys who decide they don't want to play or or whatever, and I would assume that the NCAA would probably if there's enough of enough people like that that they will probably figure out something with scholarship limits because isn't that what they did with with uh, spring sports that you know they're just you're going to have a few extra scholarships next year um, right for you know you know baseball players who want to come back for a fifth year or softball players who want to come back for a fifth year or whatever yeah I, I don't believe they count against the cap if they are if they're yeah returning yeah so it, it would not shock me if they did something like that um next year if if this is enough of an issue that you have you know five ten guys per team that that potentially are in this in that kind of spot um you know that that they may they may look at something like that and they they've shown the willingness to be flexible in that before but of course that was when the players were told they couldn't have a season you know if, if the players are given the option to play and just choose not to you know m- maybe that changes the NCAA's calculus a little bit on that but you know the NCAA also be also has to be mindful that they can't. You know they if if players feel it's not safe, uh, then you know the NCAA doesn't want to uh, put them in the no you have to do it kind of spot because, um, you know that 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 goes into the uh, these people are not employees. This is not you know I, I can't order them to do it because these people are not employees because that's that's the NCAA's whole model is no 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 these are just people who happen to play football, who are college students, so. Uh, I don't know that 
I, I would think that they would probably, if it's enough of an issue with enough people, they will probably try and figure out a way to do it. Because you're you're not, you know, a few extra people um, on each team next year who chose not to play this year is probably not going to swing the balance of power in the uh, in you know all of FBS next season. So I, I would guess you're probably not going to have a huge uh, have have them have to deal with a huge uh, influx of guys you know, in that spot. Do you think Dan Holgerson at Houston will be like, Hey everybody, let's take a red shirt. <laughs> let's just all sit out this year. We'll all come back next year and we're just going to kick everybody's butt. Let's, let's just red shirt this year. We don't need to be out here for this. And then next year we'll be all the better. And then his whole team transfers to Miami. Yes. <laughs> well, darn it. Drax. That that again. That, that's, that's where dear can King ended up, right? Was it Miami? I, yeah. I, I, think so uh, which would i don't know why any quarterback would transfer to uh to battle with tate martell <laughs> it's kind of <laughs> stupid yeah it, it, yes he did go to he did go to miami so yeah that was uh that was uh, quite a uh that was quite an interesting saga last year with him uh you can you can look at look that story up if you're interested in it but yeah he uh basically he he was the starter he played a few games it was very apparent they were going nowhere and dana holgerson said hey why don't you take a red shirt or and or Derek King said, "Hey, I want to take a red shirt," and uh, the idea was, "I'll come back next year and be ready to play." And then he transferred. So <laughs> it was kind of Houston, like the equivalent. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. No, no, no. Sorry. Go ahead. It was like the equivalent of hitting reset on like the PlayStation or something. You're like, I don't like the way this game is going. I'm red shirting. <laughs> well, that's not quite how this works. Uh, but it, I guess it's as close as they could come. And then yes. Uh, he departed, but you know, that whole thing—it sounded like it was Holgerson's idea at first. But then, you, know, you don't—you don't even know what to believe with a story that crazy. Um, just believe that everything you hear from it is true, because anything with Dana Holgerson, there's a possibility there. <laughs> anything with Dana Holgerson, anything is with anything was within reason, and anything with any any player who decides Miami is where I'm going to go play <laughs> my college football. Like also mm-hmm. you, the the uh, Overton window of uh, possible realities there is also pretty darn wide. So yeah, you could you could believe just about anything and be like, yeah, okay, I could see that. You know, a month ago at this time, we were probably um, I, don't know, I, I I was more pessimistic in terms of like yes or no, will there be a season? I was probably more towards no. Um, now. We're not seeing as much, um, as many perhaps roadblocks. And it's not that we're seeing as many roadblocks brought, brought up. We're seeing more solutions brought up or, or more positive ways that this can happen. And maybe it's because as the administrators see the lack of funds in the old, the old savings account, the old checking account, they're like, you know what? You know what we should do this year? We should play football. Uh, let's have some football this year and let's get some money in these coffers. And, and so it, it feels like things are trending in a better way. And yes, you know, we've, we've come quite a ways in a month in terms of you know, the thing is slowing down. We're able to do more in, in cities and states. I, you know, I, I saw on ESPN, the bottom line where New York and Texas and the California governors are saying, you know, it's, it's, it's about time to get, pro sports going again. And, and I think part of that was because some of the teams were threatening to, to, to go to Arizona. And so that, that takes money out of, out of the States there. And so you're like, well, you know what, maybe, maybe we do need sports back. And I think you, you go without it for so long and you start to realize, boy, I, I really do miss it. It does provide a lot. It's not 100% safe, perhaps, but what are we willing to, uh, how much are we willing to risk? What is the risk? Let's talk about making those risks and acceptable risks rather than just saying, well, it's, it's too risky. Well, like, well, let's, let's talk about it. Let's, how can we play sports and let's see if, if what the guidelines that, that the, the leaders and the, the scientists throw down there, let's see, are these things that we can do? And, you know, Ohio State's going to be willing to do whatever it takes. There's going to be segmented workouts, segmented, you know, maybe practices, who knows. 
Um, but I think what, what coaches and athletic directors want are just the, the ability to activate solutions rather than Tom just be told, no, it's, it's just not, it's not going to work. It's like, no, let's talk about the solutions and let's see if we can put them in motion. Yeah. And this is from, from what I've read and uh, I am not a doctor, but from what I've read, there's the virus doesn't do particularly well in heat, humidity and uh, sunlight or UV. So, you know, this is probably, we are probably heading into a time of year when this is, you know, less communicable and uh, maybe less dangerous to be around other people in at least some form for at least a while. So there may be a certain amount of let's uh, let's do what we can while we can uh, right now. And then, you know, when you when you start to see, you know, if it starts getting chilly again in the fall and things start getting uh, a little more dicey uh, in, in Ohio or New York or other places like that, then you can sort of revisit things then. But, you know, the, the overall trend seems to be that that things are maybe getting getting a little bit better and a little bit more uh, palatable to be to be looking at some of this stuff. And, you know, we've seen that in Ohio with the reopening of youth sports. And, uh, you know, I think a lot, I think that came a little bit out of nowhere for people. I, I was talking to, uh, someone who is a, uh, I coach my daughter's softball team and I was talking to someone who coaches, uh, their kid's baseball team in, uh, in town. And he was saying, boy, I don't know, you know, there was a, there was a fairly major community in central Ohio who had just canceled their youth baseball program. And he was worried that that was going to sort of set off this chain reaction of everyone canceling. And then literally the next day, the governor announced, okay, we're opening it up in June 1st. Like, all right, well, that was out of nowhere. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I think certainly when, uh, California and New York and Texas politicians all agree on something, that's, uh, that's quite a quorum to, uh, to be building. Cause those, those are, generally not uh, not circles that have a lot of overlap in them uh the state state politicians in those states so yeah I, I think there's there is certainly a trend of optimism and you know there there's always uh we're going to do it for the money is not always a great motivation in terms of uh, inspiring like wonderful actions but you know there's also there's also a pretty clear trend of some optimism here which is which is good and Hopefully everyone's responsible with it and, you know, continues to be smart about how they're doing this and doesn't just throw the doors wide open immediately. Just kind of manage this responsibly. And I, I think that hopefully people are people are willing to do that. And and if so, I mean, I'm, I'm a lot more optimistic about the fact that there will be some sort of college football this fall than I would have been three weeks ago. Mm -hmm. I'm with you. Uh, I... Uh... It's almost like I've been worried or, or not letting myself look forward to the season because it might not happen. But I, I feel like I can maybe look forward to it a little bit more than than you know I have been. Uh, I think things are trending well, but again, you know, month to month here, uh, and we'll see how things go. Tom, you got anything else before we call the show? No, I think we're good. Let's uh, let's just all while we're while we're heading out and playing our youth sports and doing all the other stuff you can start to do now, getting haircuts in Ohio. Let's all be smart about how we're doing them, and let's uh, continue to look out for each other and space out and wear masks when when appropriate. And let's all do our parts to uh, keep this as managed and uh, under control as we can. And every if you if you don't feel like going out in a mask, just keep reminding yourself, I'm doing this for college football. And, you know, you know, you're also doing it for all the people around you. But if the people around you aren't enough motivation, just keep telling yourself, I'm doing this for college football. Do it for Justin Fields. That's a great point, Tom. That's a great message for all of us. You know, I, I um, a couple of weeks ago, I cut my own hair, got some clippers and I just I, I cut it. Um, and then so I was like shaving my neck yesterday or the day before, and I accidentally took too much out of the back of my head. And nobody noticed it until I showed my wife. And then she just started laughing and laughing. I don't think it's that bad because, like, if you don't look at it, you don't see it. Uh, but apparently, um, apparently I did a number back there. So I, I only throw that out there because now people can go get haircuts. But you're still going to be waiting a long time. Um, I would advise people to 
like stop going to great clips because I need to get in there and get something fixed. So if you could just leave great clips alone for a while, I would appreciate it. Uh, I want to thank you all for listening. We appreciate that as well. And have a great day. Good morning.